six down, five letters. Which one of the amazing speaker lineup rhymes with villain? Hmm. Answers on the back of a postcard, people, and send them somewhere. Hopefully, our next speaker is a little bit better at making up uh, cryptic crossword clues. Not that that was cryptic in the slightest. Take to the stage. Next up for the 2021 City JS Conference is Dylan from London in the UK. Dylan is a software and technology consultant and also a Microsoft MVP. In this talk, Dylan is going to be showcasing iPuzzler, a project that he built to put interactive puzzles onto the internet and more specifically, cryptic crosswords. So I hope you have a pencil at the ready for all of those answers. If you have any questions after this talk, please do join us for the Q&A session, which will be starting shortly after, as well as keep those posts coming in on social media using the hashtag CityJS2021, as well as the comments coming in on YouTube and GatherTown and anywhere else that you are watching along at home. Dylan, it is with great pleasure that I hand the stage over to you. Hello, City JS. How is everybody doing out there around the world on the internet? I uh, hope you're all having an awesome day. They have invited me to come along. I say come along. I'm here at home like all of you are. Um, but they have invited me to talk to you today about basically the brief was come talk to us about a JavaScript thing. And uh, I did a JavaScript uh, project towards the end of last year, which was a lot of fun, had some very cool tech in it, which was a thing called iPuzzler, which is a, a JavaScript web component for doing crossword puzzles. So I'm going to tell you how I did that. Uh, a little bit about me first. This is me. Um, I run a online software training company called Ursatile, which I started last year so I could do lots of international travel. Best idea ever. Worked out really well. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP with developer tools. I run a .NET user group here in London, but I do JavaScript as well. It's fine. We're all friends together. I also once invented a programming language as a joke that uh, was so successful that now it's a joke with a reference implementation. So if you've ever wanted to be a Rockstar developer, head to codewithrockstar.com. Type in some code. It's the only programming language where the programs are also heavy metal songs. Click rock if it works. Congratulations. You're a rock star programmer. Now, I do a whole bunch of things alongside that. I do stuff with you know music and technology and comedy and code and video. And uh, one of my many weird nerdy hobbies is making crossword puzzles. Um, I started out solving them and then I started making my own. Yes, I am actually that nerdy. I make crossword puzzles for fun. And uh, occasionally I create, I created one last year for the, the US election and I sent it to a bunch of people as a PDF and they're like, you should put this online. And I thought that's a good idea, I should do that. Now the software that I use to make puzzles, it's the, the thing that pretty much everyone uses. It's a, a thing called crossword compiler. Um, and I was using an older version of it, which didn't have the most fantastic published to web feature. I think the, the version I was using still used Java applets, which if you remember them, kind of like Sclep 7, they were a really big deal about 20 years ago. And now we can't quite remember why. Um, it had a published to web feature that used Java applets, which of course doesn't work on iOS devices, or in fact, anything these days because of security sandboxing. Um, now, the, the latest version, which I have subsequently got, that also has a published web feature, but it's very much like it, it makes a web page just for your puzzle, which I kind of, as a software engineer, I kind of don't like that uh, approach. It feels a little bit fragile to me. Now, one of the things I was interested in was this whole problem of how do you publish crossword puzzles on the web? The other thing that I was uh, interested in is how can I make an app that is as good as the one on the Guardian website? That I think is the best online crossword app. The people I know do a lot of online crosswords. They really like this one. The UX on it is fantastic. And so I thought, well, maybe I could uh, borrow, I mean, copy, I mean, be influenced by their code. Because the thing about the web, right, is you can right-click view source and you can see how just about anything works. Um, that's not quite as true as it used to be back when Java applets and S Club 7 were cool. Um, this is some of the code that runs that. It is, it's good, it works, it is minified. It is all the stuff that does the, you know, advertising and user subscriptions. It's all kind of bundled in with the stuff that makes the crossword puzzles happen into a deployable unit, which is basically a page of online newspaper with a crossword puzzle in it. Um, 
and I poked around a little bit, but you know, one, this is on very dubious ground legally. If you copy code from someone else's website and then go, hey, I made this, they'd be like, no, you didn't, we made that, please stop. Um, and also, you know, as I said, this, this approach of trying to reverse engineer or to, to, to replicate the approach that they did on it, it did not work terribly well. So I took a step back, I was like, all right, what is the, the state of the art that exists for doing this kind of thing? And I found this. I found a thing called iPuzz, which is a, it's an open format for crossword puzzles and Sudoku puzzles and word searches. It's based on JSON. Um, it's pretty good. Like some people have actually put some real work into doing this and it's used on a couple of different platforms and it does have some support, but you know, we're talking here about a, a small niche. We're talking, these are the people who are into open data schemas. These are the people who are into crossword puzzles. These are the people who are into JSON data formats and this little niche in the middle. Um, maybe there's another person out there who's into that, in which case, cool, we can go and meet up in the park and we'll stand two meters apart and have a beer and say it's a conference. Um, but I didn't find a huge amount out there. Now, crossword compiler exports IPUS puzzle formats. Uh, it's still marked as experimental, but the export is there. So I can build a puzzle. I can turn it into this open standard. I went online. I had a look for, is there a player that will let me turn these into a web page? No results found. Uh -uh. Well, I say no results found. Um, I did find uh, one project, which I have anonymized here. Um, you ever see these things on GitHub where it's like three commits from six years ago and you're like, someone had a really good idea for like five hours. And then they were like, yeah, I'm actually quite bored of that now. Or it, it did the thing they needed to do and it, it never went any further. Um, this did actually work up to a point, but it didn't do what I really wanted it to do. And that's when my developer brain starts going, hey, you could build your own. How hard can it be? Now, if any of you have read uh, Fred Brooks' famous Mythical Man Month, there's a great essay in that book uh, where he talks about planning to throw one away. You know, the, the first version of any system you build is not going to be terribly good because of how much you learn in the course of building it. And so you should always plan to throw away the first one you build and then ship the second one. And I sort of, you know, went into this with this in mind. So I built version one of iPuzzler. It took about three days to get it up and running. It was a sprawling, shambling mess of, you know, HTML and inline styles and JavaScript and console logging things. This was me kind of, you know, exploring the boundaries of this problem and trying to figure out how to make it all hang together. Um, by day five, I could not understand the code that I had written on day one. So that was definitely the point where we, we throw away the first one we built. I say we, this is just me. <laughs> um, but I proved it was possible and I had a pretty good idea how to go about implementing a whole bunch of the stuff that, that I wanted to be able to do. Um, now, one of the things I didn't think about in version one is making this thing distributable. How can I come up with something really easily that I can drop on any web page or anyone can drop on any web page and use it to host interactive puzzles? Because, you know, if you, you build it in something like React or Angular, somebody who wants to use it but doesn't have React, now they got to install React. And if they're already using Angular, they need to install React as well. I sort of did some looking around. At one point, I seriously thought maybe this could be a jQuery plugin, because I know everyone thinks, you know, jQuery is, is, uh, is dead. But actually, jQuery is proving very hard to kill, and something like 85% of websites do actually have it. It also has a very stable plugin model, because it's not really an, an active development project that much anymore. So you can create a plugin that'll work across a whole range of different versions of jQuery. But then I thought, I say I thought, I had a conversation with some friends of mine and they're like, why don't you just make a web component? And I was like, I remember web components. Because I, I did a bit of reading about web components when they were, you know, drafting the spec for all this and putting together the, the technologies and the APIs which were going to make it possible. And I'm sure some of you out there, you know, web components inside that. I'm assuming some of you don't. So I'm going to give you a very quick kind of redux on what, what web components actually are, because web components are absolutely fantastic. They are basically this. They are a way that you can add tags to HTML that work directly in the browser. It's not, you know, JavaScript calls, it's not plugins, it's not some kind of backend thing like Node or PHP or, or, or ASP.NET. This is valid HTML now. And you're looking at, you're like, there is no movie quote tag in HTML. Well, there is. We've invented one. We need one extra line. We need to import a JavaScript module, which is the thing that makes that happen. So let's have a look at that JavaScript and see what that actually does. Now, there is a lot of very, very cool modern JavaScript stuff going on here. First of all, you look at the very top of this. Class movie quote extends HTML element. Class extends. We're using uh, the new class system. So this is proper. Uh, uh, 
classical as opposed to prototypical object orientation in JavaScript with inheritance, it's extending HTML element, that's provided by the browser. We get that thing for free. Then we got this constructor here. So every time we make one of our elements run this chunk of code, first thing we do is we call super that says, tell the browser to set up the HTML element and then come back when it's done and we'll add our stuff on top of it. Then we are doing this. <coughs> now, one of the technologies that makes web components possible is a thing called the shadow DOM. If you've ever had that problem where you created something like a calendar component and it's beautiful and it's reusable and then you try and use it on a website which has a different typeface or some CSS rules that control the colors and all of those cascade down into your calendar and it, it just doesn't work properly anymore, um, that's the problem. The pro one of the problems with components on uh, on the web is defining a sort of boundary and saying, no, 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 everything inside this boundary, I'm responsible for that. I am the component author here. The rest of the website's your problem, but if you're using my component, we don't want stuff leaking between them. The shadow DOM, document object model, basically gives you a little isolated sandbox where you control everything that happens with HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Uh, it means things like, uh, you know, finding elements by ID. They don't find everything on the page. They just find the ones that are part of your component, which is really, really cool. Um, once we've attached to that, that shadow DOM thing, this will probably look familiar to anyone who's written browser-side JavaScript in the last 15, 20 years. Uh, we create a span element. We're going to put our movie quote in that span element just by setting text content. And we're doing an append child to add it to that shadow DOM. And last thing we need to do is we tell the browser, hey, we are defining a custom HTML element. It's called movie quote. Here is the, the JavaScript class that defines its behavior. And when we run that, we get this. We get, use the force, Mr. Frodo, the best movie quote in history. And if you look at the inspector here on the, the left side of the screen, you can see it looks pretty familiar, but then we've got this line in here that says, you know, shadow root closed. And that tells us that's the boundary. At this point, it's not the page itself anymore. This is our component now that is responsible for this part of the, the document object model and markup and everything. Um, just a quick aside, can you use this stuff? Yep, you absolutely can. Shadow DOM is supported in everything except IE and Opera Mini, and we don't really worry too much about those anymore. Uh, custom Elements is supported in just about everything. Um, Safari, there's a, a kind of extension to the spec which lets you do like, I want to make a magical kind of paragraph. Safari won't let you do that. You can sort of define elements, but you can't extend paragraphs and diffs and things. But generally, for doing the kind of stuff we're talking about today, it works on like I said, everything except IE and Opera Mini, and we're not too worried about those. So quite often when I'm putting together a, a you know, anything, a class, a function, an API, I pay attention to the developer experience. I'm like, what's the code that I wish I could write if this thing already existed? And so I said, okay, but let's imagine I got a web page and I want to put a crossword puzzle on it. I want to be able to do that. That's it. It's as simple as putting an image on a web page. I want to say, put one of them here, read the source from this file. That's it. Can I make that possible? Now, turns out it's not quite that simple. One, uh, custom elements cannot be self-closing. You have to have a, an opening tag and a closing tag. But, you know, that's all right. We, we can live with that. And I need this line of JavaScript or this, this script import. Otherwise, it's not going to work. But that's what I'm aiming for. This should be possible. This is what I, I want to shoot for. Now. Let's have a look at this IPUS file format. So like I said, it's a JSON format for crosswords and Sudoku and word searches, all those kinds of things. Um, here is a really simple example of a crossword puzzle. We got a couple of clues, we got a grid. Um, if we export this puzzle as an IPUS file, it looks like this. Now, there's a couple of things that I always find really interesting about reading uh, data schemas and data formats that come from specific domains. Crossword puzzles are a domain. There's a bunch of rules and terminology and conventions which we need to model somehow. Now, if you, if you ever do crossword puzzles, you notice those clues like a three across, acknowledge broken crate, five. Um, that number five is a concept that needs a name. I'd never thought in my life about what that number is called because I'm just like, well, it, it's it's the how many letters bit. You know, it's the it's the length, it's the letter count, it's the, you know, what is it? There's no word for this thing. Um, in the IPUS format, they call it an enumeration. Now, that's not the name I would have chosen, but it's a name that already exists. And so 
the last thing I want to do is go, well, I'm going to make up another name that somebody will find meaningless, and then we're going to put both of them in the same domain. So quite often, you know, if I'm working with any kind of data format that's come from somewhere else, I will uh, kind of, you know, absorb all of the nuance that went into the design of that data format and try and preserve as much of that as I can, because they've done the work already. They have figured out what these things should be called. Also, that creates kind of, you know, a, a ubiquitous language, some, some consistent naming. So there's enumerations and there's dimensions and there's solutions. There are some little uh, JavaScript arrays here. Now, if you look at the, the top here, where the, the, the puzzle is defined, the crossword grid is defined as a, it's grid. It's a two-dimensional array of things. And JavaScript does not have two-dimensional arrays. But because JavaScript is dynamically typed, we can have an array of anything, and the things in the array can be other arrays. So we can create a fake 2D array, which is an array of array, like a list of lists, if you like. So this is a sort of, like it says, it's javascript -y pseudocode. Uh, don't try and run this, but this is the sort of data format that I started working on for my, for my puzzle engine. Um, now that grid of cells, there is a bit of a headache in JavaScript. If you're working with 2D arrays, um, you think of it in terms of that's the X coordinate and that's the Y coordinate and that's the cell that I wanna talk to, right? But because the arrays are nested the other way around, you need to index them by providing the Y coordinate first and then the X coordinate and that'll give you the correct cell. This was just a total nightmare. Cells X, Y, that's how we think, you know, X, Y coordinates, alphabetical order, every piece of maths homework you ever did in your life, X first, then Y, easy to remember, intuitive, wrong, doesn't work, bad. Cells Y, X, that is correct, but arg my brain, I cannot think like that. And I had so many bugs because I got the X and Y the wrong way around. And so after like several days of this, I just thought, you know what, maybe there is a way of just solving this problem. I threw out X and Y. I called them row and column everywhere because when we think row and column, we think Excel. We think spreadsheets, row comes first, then the column, and that gives you the correct indexing behavior into a two-dimensional JavaScript array. You have your row first, how far down do you go, and then your column is how far across, and that gives you the, the, thing, that, the thing that you need. So the crossword grid is modeled as an array of arrays of these cell objects. Let's uh, take a quick look at the cell. Actually, before that, let's take a quick look at this. Um, every cell has a position. And initially, this was just a row and a column as numbers on the cell. But actually, it turned out there's a bunch of behavior that positions have that it made sense to make them their own class so that I could I could encapsulate this. One of them here is a method called is inside. Take any position, you go, hey, are you in this grid or have I fallen off the edge? And the position will tell you whether it's inside or not. The other one is you want to move up, left, right. One of the frustrating things with crosswords is that um, up is the opposite of down, but across is not the opposite of across. So we have this switch statement with across and right meaning the same thing. But this gives us some kind of coordinate navigation. And then inside the cell itself, I'm like, all right, so a cell has, it has a position. It has a uh, an object of clues where, is there an across clue? Is there a down clue? Because some cells in a crossword are associated with, with clues in two directions. And the next and previous tell you, well, when someone types a letter in the cell, which cell do they move to next? And again, they might be going across at that point or they might be going down at that point. So there's a next and a previous, each of which exists in two dimensions. Then there is a bunch of extra behavior to do with tracking the state of the puzzle. A crossword puzzle on paper, filled in or not filled in. The paper itself doesn't need to know which clue you're looking at and where you're pointing your pencil. On the web, we need to do that because we need to manage and provide cues. So there's things like, what's the current value of the cell? Uh, is this cell currently active? Does it need to be highlighted? That kind of stuff. Um, the architecture or the sort of the object model that I ended up with, it looks like this. So we've got the puzzle. A puzzle has a collection of cell arrays and each cell array contains a collection of cells. Each cell has a position, exactly one position. Every cell has four references to other cells. That's your previous down, previous across, next down, next across. Every puzzle has a bunch of clues. The clues are the down clues and the across clues. And then the clue needs to know which cells belong to that clue. And the cell needs to know which down and across clues go with that uh, cell so that we can handle highlighting the right things when you click on certain places. 
the puzzle keeps track of which clue you're looking at and which cell you're looking at. The reason that's at the puzzle level is you can't have two. If you've got one over here, then, you know, if you have two clues and both of them say, I have the focus, that can't happen. That's not a, a scenario that can exist. So the puzzle has a single cell reference to say which cell you're currently pointing at and a single reference to say which clue are you currently pointing at. And the clue itself has a bunch of other clues in case it's one of those ones where like, you know, one across, C4 across, four across, C9 down, nine down, C15 across. These are called continuations. It's where you have one clue that spans multiple bits of the puzzle. So that's the object model that runs. This is kind of, it runs in the browser, but this is kind of the backend code. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't know anything about HTML. It doesn't know anything about mice and keyboards and all that kind of stuff. This models our domain. Now, to get one of these things out of an IPUS file, we got to be able to parse it. Now, at this point, I, I created a thing called a parser, but the naming there is a little bit misleading. Because IPUS is a JSON dialect, the browser will parse it for us. So what we actually get is we run IPUS through the browser's response.json, and we get what I call an IPUS-shaped JavaScript object. It has the same, the IPUS file is a string. The string turns into a JS object, and then the parser, which is actually an object mapper, turns that into a puzzle object. So this is how we instantiate one of these things to start with. Then the bit that actually runs, the gameplay engine model, if you like. We turn the puzzle into, uh, or we turn the IPUS file into the IPUS object, turn that into a puzzle. Then the puzzle runs through a thing called the renderer. This is what turns it into HTML and puts it out on the screen. The renderer draws it. That's what we can see on the screen. We are going to click stuff, and we are going to press keys. And if you're using it on a phone, we are going to touch things. All of those events need to be handled in a way that translates them back into puzzle code. That will update the state of the puzzle. The puzzle then needs to be pushed back through the renderer again and update those so we can see, see what's changed as a result of whatever we just did. Now, let's have a look at the some of the code from the renderer here. The renderer is basically a big bag of references to HTML elements that exist in our shadow DOM. So to construct one, we say, hey, here's the shadow DOM. You're going to draw your puzzle in here. It has spans. It has inputs. It has labels. It has list items. It has buttons. It has a grid. Um, the implementation is not here. You can find that on GitHub if you want to go and look at it. Now, if any of you out there work with React, uh, you'll probably know one of the things, in fact, the main thing that's made React so successful is that it is a uh, it's a declarative API. You don't have to explain how to update things. You just say, this should look like this now. And the React engine works out for you which bits of the browser need to be added and removed and redrawn and modified and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's called the, the DOM diffing algorithm. It takes a, a virtual DOM, which is kind of, this is what your web page is going to look like in a second or in a 10 milliseconds. It takes the real DOM, it works out the differences between them, and then it, it draws those changes. It is incredibly clever. And at this point, I start thinking, am I going to end up reinventing React just so I can draw crossword puzzles? But then I realized something. If you watch what happens when you are actually doing a crossword puzzle, the shape of the puzzle never changes during play. You've got to draw the thing first. So you need to put the grid and the, the clues on the screen when you first, first draw it. But after that, really all I'm doing is I'm changing the colors of elements, which I can do using CSS by adding and removing classes. And I'm putting letters in inputs, which is something browsers are very good at doing natively. So I could split the rendering logic out into two different methods. I have the big expensive method, which draws the puzzle when you first start. And then I have the small fast method, which happens every time you click anything. But the shape of the puzzle doesn't change during play. All that changes is the colors and the content of those, those grid boxes. So I split out that rendering logic into two methods. Render is the big heavy one. Update is the one that just toggles CSS classes and keeps track of what you're doing. Um, I had to add a third one. It turns out that resizing the browser window, uh, if you do that halfway through playing a puzzle, we need to redo a whole bunch of calculations. And so there's a resize handler on the renderer as well. That's bound to the, the resize object. In terms of the way the layout actually fits together, the puzzle itself is a CSS grid. Um, the clue lists are HTML ordered lists. Uh, one of the fun things, they are ordered lists that don't go one, two, three. 
If you look at this example here, the across clues go 1, 5, 7, 8, 10, 11. Um, what I've actually done there is I'm keeping ordered list because that gives good semantics for uh, you know accessibility and stuff. Um, I don't let the browser draw the numbers for me. Those numbers are actually part of my markup that I'm putting out. There is a list item style none set on here. Um, each cell is uh, a span. The ones that you can type in, they have an input inside the span. The other ones just have a black background color effect on them. Now, almost all of the CSS here is external. There is a, a SAS file that gets compiled and bundled into the component when it's deployed. Almost. There are a couple of details that I couldn't control for it. Uh, we don't know in advance how big the puzzle is, how many rows, how many columns. So there's some code in the renderer that actually injects a little bit of inline style to make sure that grid is rendering at the right size, and then calculates a bunch of, of font sizes and stuff based on that. Uh, by the way, if you've not seen CSS grids before, um, Amy Kapernick has a, a talk on YouTube she did at NDC last year, which is fantastic. And that's what kind of introduced me to CSS grids, and they're brilliant. And you should go and check them out because you can do all kinds of cool stuff with them. Let's have a look at a little snippet of the code from the, the renderer itself. So uh, this is a pattern that I really like. We have the puzzle object, which has a bunch of cells, which remember is an array of arrays. It's a list of lists. So as part of rendering the puzzle, I'm going to say puzzle.cells.map, and that's going to run a function for every element in that array. But those elements, they are arrays. So I'm then going to do another map. I'm going to say, all right, for each row, row index, I want you to do row.map. And now you're going to pass in the cell, which is the element, and the column index, which means that the, the innermost function here, that knows which cell I'm drawing. It knows the index of the row. It knows the index of the column. So I can call a function I've got here that takes cells and turns them into HTML spans, which is create cell span. I know that's really imaginative. Then I push that into the grid with an append child, but then I return it. And because of the way the map works, I end up with this dot spans as a big list of references to all of the spans which are part of that puzzle, which is then very, very useful for being able to, to quickly rattle through things and check the states of all of them and that kind of stuff. Massive wall of code. You are not expected to read it, but there are a bunch of magic numbers in here. Um, I discovered all kinds of things that I did not know about iOS devices. And uh, if you see the comment in there, 16 pixels is the magic number. If there is text smaller than 16 pixels, when you tap an input on an iPhone, it will zoom in and that ruins the layout and you can't see the clues anymore. So there's a bunch of magic numbers in here just to make sure that if you're kind of almost at the point where it would render nicely, I deliberately bump it over that rendering threshold. This stuff was just trial and error. It's literally sat there with Safari on an iPhone, pressing refresh and changing something and pressing refresh. And eventually I got something that, that works pretty well. Um, it works down to iPhone SE. If you want to do crossword puzzles on your wristwatch, you are on your own. That is not a use case that I support. So. We've got the object model. We've got the, uh, the, the the parser or the object mapper that pretends it's a parser. We've got the renderer. We're putting stuff on the screen. It's getting drawn. We got some CSS. Last thing that we need to do is this bit. We need to handle the events that come out of the browser and translate those into things that happen to the puzzle. Now, if you look at the component, the actual iPuzzler component, which gets drawn on the screen, uh, Looks familiar from the example we saw earlier. We got iPuzzler extends HTML element. Now in the constructor here, I'm attaching the shadow DOM and then I'm adding two event listers, one for key down events. And the other one is if I resize the window, I want to pass that through into the, the puzzle object itself. Now, if you have a look at the, the load and the init methods here, the load method is using the fetch API. It downloads the iPuzz from that URL. Then it does the response.json we talked about. It takes this object, which is called JSON, even though it's kind of not. Um, and it passes that to the init method. And then the init method is going, all right, pass the JSON, give me a puzzle, give me a renderer, wrap that around the shadow DOM, and then attach the event handlers to all the clickable and draggable and typeable things that exist inside that puzzle. And finally, just call resize to make sure everything's lining up properly. Uh, there's a couple of heavyweight events where the easiest way to control a rendering is to do an explicit resize at the end of it. Now, None of this actually does anything, right? Like, like there's a load method and an init method, but the constructor never calls them. So how does it happen? What makes it actually actually happen on screen? Well, there's this, this function connected callback uh, that you can just see down at the bottom of the screen. Connected callback is the thing that fires when the browser renders your component. So when connected callback in there, I'm calling init, I'm calling load, I'm calling init, that's what actually sets the thing up. 
Now, I just want to say a little bit about how these event handlers get attached. This is something I've seen lots of people get confused about when it comes to doing, you know, browser, interactive browser programming in JavaScript. Um, event handlers, in fact, any method in JavaScript, it isn't actually owned by the class that owns it. That's just a convenient way to put the code. So I have these two attach handlers down here. I've got input add event listener on, uh, on the click event. I want to call this dot input click. And this input click here, that's a method, a reference to a method that exists in my component, in my HTML element. But then the other one, I have this input click dot bind this. What's the difference between the two? Well, the top one, when we run that input click code, you can see at the top, this refers to the button. It refers to the, or the input. It refers to the thing that got clicked. And it is going to blow up because the thing that got clicked is an HTML element on a page. It doesn't have a dot puzzle and it doesn't have a dot renderer because it, we're running the code basically in the wrong context. The second one there, the input click dot bind, that will ensure that the uh, when the, the method is invoked, it's invoked in the context of our iPuzzler component. So this dot puzzle do something. Yeah, this dot puzzle is fine. This dot renderer that update, that'll find the renderer. Um, so that's that's what the, the bind syntax that all these event handlers use here actually does. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about how these things are implemented. I've got two uh, bits of code here. These are two event handlers from that puzzler. And you see the top one here, we've got when we capture a input focus, so we click on one of the inputs, we are going to call this dot puzzle dot set focus. Now, that is just saying, hey, tell the puzzle to set a focus to this row and this column. And the second one, the clue list item, that's causing a method, calling a method called focus clue. This abstracts out everything between the HTML on one side of it and the logic of our puzzle engine on the other side of it. So that's how all of our handlers are implemented. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about today, because we are very nearly at it, actually we are out of time, but we started, I think, two minutes late. So I'm going to take two more minutes. So um, that's our architecture. That's how it's all wired together. And this whole thing is tested. There are a whole load of tests that verify all of those bits and pieces are wired in and, and connected together properly. Um, but I'm not doing any browser testing. I'm not using Selenium or uh, Puppet or any of those kind of, you know, Puppeteer or any of the headless browser things. The testing is based on the way the system is designed. So all the tests for this, they're built using Jest, uh, which is something I'd not worked with a lot before this. Jest is awesome and I, I love it. It's really, really cool. But have a look at some of the test cases here. So this test is saying, well, when we press the home key, so this is testing the puzzle. It's not testing the user interactions. We got this thing in here that says, all right, set up a new puzzle. Here's a bunch of places where you can start. Set the focus, puzzle.setFocus to that point in the puzzle and then call the puzzle.home method. Now that method's just called home because it's a good name for it. It has no kind of strong association with the home key. It's just that's what the method's called. So this verifies the behavior of the puzzle regardless of how that behavior was invoked. If you have a look at the, uh, those are the, the, the puzzle.home methods that actually get called here. Now, if you have a look at the other side of the testing, this is making sure that the component is working properly. So I'm, I'm using Jest's mocking capability here. I'm saying, just give me a function which is gonna take an event and return an event, but then I'm gonna replace my puzzle.home method with that mocked method. Then I am gonna make a fake event, which is it's pretending to be an HTML input. I am going to simulate that event, that key down event getting called with an event whose key code is home. And I am gonna verify that that mock has been called. So by doing this, we're verifying the same pattern of behavior from two different angles. One of them we're verifying, hey, when home gets called, does the puzzle do the right thing? Separately, we're saying, when that key gets pressed, does home get called? And that gives us a very nice level of, of decoupling and abstraction between the two parts of the system. And that is a very, very rapid run through. iPuzzler is online. It is GitHub. It is open source. It is, uh, the whole thing is completely online, including some interactive demo puzzles. There are a bunch of links here. Go and check it out. There is a project website for it. There is a, uh, as I said, the code itself is on GitHub. You can go and play around with that. If you find any of this stuff interesting, want to know more about it, I do actually run workshops where I teach people how to build JavaScript web components. You can check those out at uh, urs.tl, ursatile slash jsweb. And finally today, 
There is a CityJS interactive crossword puzzle up on the web, which you are all welcome to go and pit your wits against and see how you get on with that. Uh, one, it's a nice way of trying out some of the code that I showed you. You can right click, you can view source. It's minified, so it probably won't make a huge amount of sense, but you can see how it's actually behaving. You can play around with that for yourself. Uh, and you can see if you can solve all of the fiendishly difficult clues that I have left in there for you, some of which are actually quite JavaScripty. And uh, that, my friends, is me done. That is iPuzzler, a pure JavaScript web component for playing crossword puzzles. Now, I believe I get to jump off here. I get to join another call and do some live Q&A. Um, this is normally the point where a little voice in my ear says, yes, you do that, or no, you don't do that. But there is no voice in my ear. So uh, I'm going to stick around on here. It's kind of weird doing online conferences, because I'm talking to a camera right now. Ah, there he is. Hello, Tyler. <laughs> Dylan, thank you very much for that pretty amazing talk on incorporating JavaScript, web components, and cryptic crosswords into one. And that is a sentence I never thought I would ever say. Now, I am stood here wondering whether any of our amazing audience are going to go away and create a crossword all about our amazing speakers at this year's conference. Hmm. If anyone does put that together in the next few days, please do tag us on social media using the hashtag CityJS2021. We would love to see it. Anyway, back to the talks. Please do join me in giving Dylan a huge round the world round of applause. Any moment now. Dylan will be joining me on Gather Town for a Q&A session. So if you have a burning question for him, or maybe you just want your crosswords debugged please do join us there and post your questions if you're not on gather town let us know what you thought of that talk using the hashtag cityjs2021 on twitter in the youtube comments or wherever it else it is that you're watching along at home once again thank you dylan for that amazing talk dylan fantastic talk another amazing javascript edition for the community to enjoy congratulations and i think we'll get <laughs> straight into the q a's we've had a question come in from andre i believe um have you tried your project ipuzzler in a screen reader and if uh, not oh sorry no, <laughs> no. um so in terms of, uh, I'm guessing that the question there is, is you know, about accessibility. And uh, there are, um, you know, crossword puzzles are one of those, those things that are interesting because the accessibility is not just about reading what's out there. There's a bunch of additional metadata which makes them accessible for people who can't see them or can't see them well about the layout of the puzzle and stuff. Um, I have not tried it in a screen reader. It is mostly semantic HTML. The lists are lists which are in sections and they have headings. The CSS grid layout is obviously a bit of a headache when it comes to accessible rendering, because uh, if you just kind of read the thing, it's, it's a very, very spatial kind of mm -hmm. technology. It's designed to put specific things in specific places, and they have sets of spatial relationships which exist in two dimensions, which are difficult to translate to um, like an audio equivalent or something. Um, okay. I mean, it would be... A, a, on the one hand, it would be fascinating, as well as the accessibility things, to be able to do crossword puzzles when you're driving without having to look at anything, because uh, my dad actually used to do that. He'd memorize as many clues as he could before he started, and then he'd try and solve them in his head. And then when he stopped for a cup of coffee, he'd write them in and memorize some more. So there could be an interesting angle there. Um, I'm just going to chime yeah. in there and say this <laughs> conference does not suggest that you do crosswords while you're driving. Do not do crossword puzzles while you are driving. Yes. Um, but no, it, it's, there's a, some really interesting stuff. The Microsoft Inclusivity Toolkit, uh, which is a wonderful resource, mm. has all these, these great... I think a lot of people think of accessibility as being something to do with, um, you know, various models of disability. And they're like, no, 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 it's actually, you know, the, this person can't hear because they're hearing impaired. This person can't hear because they're in a loud nightclub. This person can't hear because they have an ear infection. You know, th this person only has one arm, but this person is holding a baby under one arm. And it sort of starts you thinking, actually, there are all these accessibility and, you know, inclusivity ideas that apply to situations as well as to, you know, individuals. And there's all kinds of ways of, of interpreting them. 
Um, so yeah, that when you sort of mentioned screen readers, I thought, I wonder if you could build something to let you do crossword puzzles without having to look at anything, because then it would be useful for motorists as well as, as people with accessibility requirements. So, well, but no, I haven't, I haven't tried it. Um, build one for everyone's favorite smart speaker, which we will not say <laughs> on air. We can say it on air and see how many of them wake up. <laughs> That's a, a good thing, but let's not do it because I've got one in the room here with me. And All right, <laughs> we I'll behave. Um, so the follow-up to that question was, uh, would you be open to the uh, Andre to make a pull request? Yeah. If they think that they can get it to Absolutely. work with screen readers? Fantastic. So there you go. First pull request. I'm a, a firm believer. If you're not open to pull requests, you shouldn't have put it on GitHub. No. Because, um, yeah. <laughs> that, that kind of brings me on to my next question. Um, and this is one from me, not the audience. Um why cryptic crosswords? Are you just a sadistic individual generally, or is this a special niche of sadism for you that you want people to do cryptic crosswords? It is, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I sort of, when I, I first encountered them as a kid, I wanted to do them because I couldn't. And I have that, that streak that I think a lot of developers have of like, don't tell me it's too difficult. I'll show you. And then you're like, oh, okay, this is actually quite difficult. Um, but I, I enjoy the way they force you to take a step back from your own assumptions about language and, you know, really like push it. Like you read a, read a, a cryptic crossword clue and you think, all right, that's a perfectly good sentence. And then you're like, no, I, I must not parse the language that way. I need to break down every single component of this sentence and what could it mean? What are the other meanings? Could any of these words possibly mean like an anagram or mixing things up or doing something backwards? Um, and I just, I, I like the little dopamine rush you get when you solve one. And it's, uh, it's, it's weird. You sort of, you know, sit down and look at it for half an hour, don't solve anything. You go away and you think about it and you come back. You're like, oh yeah, of course it's that. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a, a, a very, very fun way. It's also a good way of learning new words. I think I probably learn two or three words a week just doing crossword puzzles. So that's good. So you're just a learner through and through, which I'm sure chimes a lot with the audience uh, watching along. Yeah, the you know, there are there, there are there are a fun way of deconstructing language and learning things along the way. Yeah, definitely. Um, so something that I was interested in, you said mm -hmm. that custom elements, can yep. we use them? And yep. you said yes. Yep. Can we really? Yep. I mean, this is a fun project and you know nobody's gonna suffer theoretically if it doesn't run in a web browser but can we really use them in mission critical projects uh what is the mission and why is it critical i mean that's a good question i'm um, supposed to be the one asking questions <laughs> <laughs> you know people say can we it's like well you know every um when we make choices about technology we have to understand the threat models we have to understand the consequences if one of those things uh, doesn't pay off uh, any decision about embracing a new technology is a combination of is this does this offer a compelling advantage to us in terms of what we're doing and you know for me the compelling advantage here is i want to make a component that in principle anyone can run on any website that will work across browsers with minimal dependencies i don't want you know jquery react angular view um this node package that and all these kinds of things um and you know i've been i've been writing javascript a long long time like since the late 90s and the things that happen natively in web browsers those are the things which tend to stand the test of time you know, Java applets were a layer on top of it that eventually got deprecated. Flash, uh, Shockwave, these are all layers on top of it, Silverlight, all this kind of stuff. But the things that worked in browsers in the 1990s, they all still work. I actually, I have a, a website I recently resurrected that hasn't been touched in 22 years and it still works in all modern browsers. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the frameworks like jQuery and React and Angular, all of them exist because somebody identified a gap and a way of being more efficient or writing more performant code or just, you know, jQuery started out as these browsers are all different and it's chaos. So I wonder if we can level the playing field by building something that makes them more consistent as a, a programmer experience. Um, I believe, you know, web components are, they are going to stick around. They are here to stay. They are a set of W3C specs. Uh, actually, one of the four the web components was four things when it first started. Uh, it's HTML templates, which I didn't talk about, but those are still around. It is uh, custom elements. It is the shadow DOM and it's HTML imports, which is already deprecated in favor of ECMAScript, ECMAScript module syntax. 
Um, so one of the four bits of web components has already been like, no, this is not the best way, but it does still work. You know, the browsers that implemented support for it, uh, you know, browsers generally don't deprecate stuff that already works because if people are using it, then you have a, you know, that's sort of a, a, not a legal contract, but you have a pact with them. So, yeah. And we, we like that pact. We love the web browsers for keeping that stuff in there. Put it, put it this way. I think if you had to make a choice right now between Angular, React, or web components, the person who chose web components is going to have a better time of it in five years. And on that bombshell, I think that's our final thought for the Q&A. Um, <laughs> Dylan, thank you very much for an amazing talk and for an uh, informative Q&A as well. I'm sure you're going to have loads of people getting in touch with you on Twitter. You're most um, welcome. And- everywhere else and before we head out of this session i just need to let everybody watching along at home that there are three parallel sessions happening next which is quite exciting for us behind the scenes i will tell you um but from your point of view there's going to be something happening in the main stage uh, there's going to be something in the expo room and there's going to be something in the workshop room so have a little rummage around and see which one takes your fancy and dylan once again thank you very much for an cool. amazing talk so I'll be I'll be back I'll be on the secret stage on Gathertown on Friday night closing out with some some music and comedy and those kinds of bits and pieces. That's um, the secret stage. So, <laughs> well, it's, it's not like you'll play the secret stage. I'm like, no, no, no. Tell people about it. 